This episode of Author Stories is brought to you by Athon Books. Check out the very best in science fiction and fantasy at athonbooks.com. You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, J.T. Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Prince Anderson, Robin Mom, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is... Thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I am super excited to have Carol Edgarian on the show with me today. She has an amazing new book. It's called Vera, and I think you guys are going to love this book. It's full of every human emotion you can imagine, and uh, who doesn't love to just fall into a book and go to a completely different world? And this is this is one of those books that will do it for you. Uh, welcome to the show, Carol. Oh, Hank, thank you so much. I'm I'm thrilled to be here. I'm uh, super excited to have you. Uh, Carol, we begin each show with the same question, and that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? Well, I, I, was, I was an early and avid reader, you know, uh, lights out with the, <laughs> with the flashlight under the cover, finishing <laughs> the book. But I think um, the first indication that I was going to be a writer was when I was very young and I was the youngest of three and um, my mother took me everywhere. And I remember um, it was before I started school, so I could have been as young as four, four and a half. And I was with my mother at, in a living room um, of some of her friends. So these were women sitting around talking, you know, having a cup of coffee. And I was on the floor supposedly playing, but actually I was listening to their conversation. And I remember looking up at one of my mother's friends who had been who said something. And I thought, I don't think she's happy. And in that way, I was always thinking of, of the story behind the story and, and, and what people, what was make, what makes people tick. And I think for me as a writer, um, that's so much of what drives me in a story is what makes someone tick. That, that is a, uh, that has been my entire motivation uh, for, <laughs> for this podcast. And, you know, we've done over a thousand and fifty shows and, and I, I, I want to know what makes creative people tick and what, what mm -hmm. makes, what makes a story just come alive in, in your mind and in, in your, your, your heart and your imagination. Uh, and that is a, a life, a lifelong pursuit, I think. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's unanswerable. And that's, what's so fun about it because every, Every person and every character is is unique in terms of their desires, um, what what drives them, and then of course the contradictions. Because we're we're never just one thing; we're so many things. And as much as um, a character might be moving towards something, they often you know thwart themselves. They're often they've often got such co conflicting emotion that that the the path forward is never it's never linear and that's really interesting to me and and really interesting if i can get a number of those characters moving wanting opposing things and have them have to work it out absolutely um carol you are um you're from the east coast right um connecticut Connecticut originally. I've been I've been out on the West Coast for a few decades, but um, originally Connecticut. Yep. That's I, I thought that you were now on the West Coast, the, the San Francisco area. Is that right? Yes, correct. Uh, I'm 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 fascinated at how a sense of place uh, works its way into the stories that we tell, and and sometimes it shows up in the most unique ways. Um, 
but being uh, an East Coaster who now lives on the West Coast, um, do you, do you feel any tension between those two uh, anchors of place? And uh, do you think that either one of those or both of them uh, has a way of showing up in the stories that you tell? That's a really that's a really interesting question. My first novel, Rise of the Euphrates, took place in a fictional Connecticut town. Um, not dissimilar from the town I I grew up in. Um, I grew up around the Hartford area in a couple different towns. In my last two novels, this one, Vera, and the one before, Three Stages of Amazement, took place in San Francisco. And so certainly San Francisco has caught my fancy. But I think we bring, I think we bring place with us, you know, and I, and one of the one of the abiding themes in all of my work is this, um, and I think it's so common to to so many of us is this sense of displacement, of of being uprooted, of of looking for home, and that's certainly a theme in Vera, you know, and where displacement uh, comes comes. Um, for me, and is something I think I've I've been working through, and a lot of my fiction is, if we go, if we go even before Connecticut, um, both my grandparents, uh, both my parents were first generation American, and my uh, my father's parents came um, really um, bearing the trauma, the scars of the Armenian genocide, and my, on my mother's side. Um, they came, they were, they came against their will. They were alcoholics and they were brought by uh, their matriarch to this country during prohibition, thinking it would be hard for them to get a hold of booze. And of course it wasn't hard. And my mother was put in an orphanage when she was five and where she stayed till she was 18. So this notion of displacement and home, home is where your people are, is very much something I was working with in this new novel, Vera. And of course, in in Vera, everyone loses their home um, in the aftermath of the 1906 earthquake and fire, when 28,000 buildings, 500 city blocks were leveled. 250,000 people in the city of San Francisco were homeless. Wow. That, that, when, when you base a story um, a, around um, an, an historical event and a, a time that, uh, that is in the public record that, that people, you know, hearken back to and, and place, uh, you know, plant flags and, you know, th- this happened uh, and, and kind of becomes part of the, the cultural heritage uh, in in ways uh, when you start thinking of uh, of a fictional story and characters that you place in there, how careful are you to preserve the uh, the historicity of of the event um, while allowing yourself the freedom to explore fictional characters that that come in and out of that that actual happening? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, I always do. Uh, I do a lot of research and I love that Curious George aspect of diving deep into a new world and learning what what happened and the stories around what happened. So I, I dive deep. I get I get saturated. I, 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 I know enough to be dangerous. <laughs> and then I kind of willfully forget um, so that maybe it's just breadcrumbs from 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 the history and and in reading about the history um i never know what little tidbits i'm going to pull that are going to that are going to work that work their way and i'll give you an example of that but but in vera there's a there's a whole world of real historical characters and certainly the moment of the quake but on top of that there's a whole fictional world of people and I always think of it as, you know, I'm left with these breadcrumbs of, of, of what actually happened. And from them, I have to build the house. So it's just, it's, it's so important to have 
the markers that make it feel utterly real and true, but not to be limited by them and not to have it feel like a history book. I want readers to just get immersed, but I want them to completely forget that there's research behind it. Sure. Um, so one example um, that I, I think is kind of a fun example is, you know, the, um, the day before, the night before the 1906 earthquake, Enrico Caruso came to sing in Carmen in the opera. And it was a big moment in San Francisco because San Francisco was still a really renegade town. It was still a little bit wild west. And they were they were trying to be, you know, real society. And this was a real marker that this great tenor had come all the way across the country to sing. And so everybody who was anybody um, showed up. Well, Caruso, who was from Naples, had just survived Mount Vesuvius erupting. And he was really traumatized. And he got on a train in New York to come west. And all he had heard about San Francisco was that it was kind of a wild, murderous town. And he couldn't sleep for the 10 days on the train ride. So at one point he had his valet get off the train and buy him a gun in case he needed to defend himself. Now I read that somewhere, I don't know where I found it, but I kept thinking about that gun and where it might show up. So in the book, um, not to give too much away, but you know, when he when he appears on stage, he has the pistol with him and the costume director turns to the director and says, what's what's Caruso doing with a gun? Um, all of that is fictional, but could be true. Um, and then, of course, the poor guy wakes up the following morning pre dawn to an earthquake um, and he sur has to survive that. And um there's lots of stories, uh, even a first-hand account of his, of, you know, he's standing in the street. There, there, There's collapse everywhere. There's dead horses. People are wounded. And Caruso is obsessed on getting his valet to bring down his 50 trunks <laughs> from his suite. <laughs> I mean, you know, that's the folly of human nature. It's, it's, um, and that's, that's just one little moment. Um, you know, there are so many moments. Uh, and of course, um, in the book, it, while, it, while the earthquake is, is pivotal, this is really an adventure story about a girl who's 15, who is housed but homeless, who is surrounded by family but unloved, who is looking for a, a moral compass in a completely corrupted world. The world of San Francisco at the time, the the, the mayor, a, a fellow named Eugene Schmitz, was going to be indicted for graft the morning of the quake, and instead he got the quake. And so a lot of the book is about all these all these figures, some real, some imagined, who are who are wheeling and dealing, and where. Where is the honor among thieves, you could say, <laughs> is a theme of the book, because in the book, everyone's a thief of one of one order or, or another. Are you looking for software that helps you bring your novel to life? Novelize is a web based writing app which allows you to access your work on any device with a browser and an Internet connection right from your desktop, laptop, tablet or smartphone just get the novel written. Say goodbye to sticky notes. With our notebook on the side, you can keep track of all the important information you need to write your novel. We keep distractions to a minimum, help you track your progress, and encourage you to write more novels. You can even use the same notebook for your novels in a series. Outline, write, or organize your novel by switching between modes. You can write your outline notes while you're writing, and you can move scenes and chapters around anytime in the organized mode. Choose between the dark and light theme to help prevent eye strain so that you can stay immersed in your book. Novelize, the app for writers by writer. Authors, I have a fantastic new service to tell you about. It's called PubSite. PubSite is a service to help you build your very own website 
your home on the web where you can promote your work and give your fans a place to connect with you. PubSite is a website platform that allows every author, regardless of budget, to have a great-looking professional website developed by the book marketing professionals at FSB Associates. PubSite is the new easy-to-use DIY website builder developed specifically for books and authors. Whether you're an author of one book or 20, or a small publisher, PubSite allows you to build, design, and most importantly, update your website pain-free. No need to be dependent on a designer or webmaster to make a small but costly change to your website. Save the money and do it yourself. PubSite is the best platform for authors because it's a book-centric platform. PubSite was built just for authors and small publishers. Every design, feature, and layout is book-centric. They have customized designs for you to use. It's easy to build. No coding or HTML is necessary to create a stunning, professional-looking website with all the features you want. Get a custom domain name, yourname.com. It's simple to update. You can add all of your books, add a blog and a book tour, sell from any retailer, manage your email list and social media, and even do e-commerce. Build your website with a 14-day free trial, then pay just $19.99 per month, which includes hosting. And we offer packages starting at $499 to set up the website for you. Pub-Site.com, the place to help authors find their home on the web um carol you when you mentioned vera a minute ago you said she was housed but homeless um that is an evocative uh statement and if you don't know anything about the character of vera um that brings uh all sorts of uh you know your 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 imagination just kind of goes wild when you hear a statement like that um I love to talk about the beginnings of things and, mm. uh, and, you know, books are, are such a fun thing. Stories in general, just, um, you know, one moment you're sitting there and none of this exists. Um, and then either a character walks onto the stage of your mind or you read a news article, or maybe you, you know, uh, run across a, a documentary about this historical event or something. And then it, it, comes alive and all of a sudden vera the novel exists in some form uh, in in your mind you know and and then it takes time to get it on paper and editing and all of that kind of stuff but there there's there's this there's a line there where vera didn't exist and now she does um what was it that what was that kernel of an idea that that began all of this kind of steamrolling for you well in terms of vera as a character you know, I I wanted to write an adventure story that featured a girl, a girl who was contrary. Um, and to be contrary in 1906 means you're not a pleaser, you're not particularly beautiful, you are smart, maybe with a sharp tongue, <laughs> all those things, but you're capable. I mean, and and how do you prove you're capable? Well, there's nothing like a catastrophe to uh, set that in motion. You know, just to, to give listeners a little bit of background about Vera. This is a, Vera was, um, is the daughter of the most successful madam, one of the most successful madams in San Francisco at the time. Um, a woman named Rose, who ran an establishment, all of this um, fictional, ran an establishment called The Rose. And she is not just a madam, she is a very accomplished businesswoman with her hand in lots of tills, if you will. And when Vera uh, is two, she um, hires a Swedish widow who has one daughter and is, um, you know, out of luck and out of money, um, they engage in a bargain where Rose brings this widow, Mor- Maury, and her daughter, Pi, to the city, puts them in a house, and it is Maury's charge to raise Vera. 
and Maury is a drinker. She's got her own gambling debt problem. And she doesn't really love or understand Vera. Vera looks very different. Vera's Vera's olive skinned, dark haired, dark eyed, and and Maury and Pi are fair Swedes. So on the street, people know there's something not quite right. And behind closed doors, they are a very different, they're very different characters. And Vera, of course, longs to be with her mother, Rose, and Rose will only see her three times a year. So all of that tension is in the beginning of the book of yearning for someone she cannot have, yearning for family or belonging somewhere, um, somewhere in the world. I mean, there's the line early on, all my life, I was looking for a catastrophe greater than my birth. And when I came across that line, Hank, I knew I had a character and I knew I had a story. Um, and there's the before of of life, life in the city, life for Vera. And then, of course, the quake happens and who and what rises out of the ashes and how Vera quickly goes from becoming a girl to a young woman and someone who has the responsibility for taking care of her entire world and and for surviving and who she joins forces with um, are not the people th that she has been put with, but the people um, also in some way um, outsiders in their various worlds who come together and prove to one another that they that they they in they in the refashioning the remaking of the world become a family what uh, what sort of resources did you lean on to get the the feeling and the flavor uh, of 1906 uh, San Francisco uh, because you know when you when you read the book it 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 transports you to another time Ooh, and another place. Right. What, what what sorts of things do you lean on to to make sure you get the little detail? This is it's the little details. It's the little right. You're yes. absolutely right. It's the so, little details, and they have to be just the right details. Right. And that takes a lot. It takes a lot of work and stripping away, and um, so that you feel. You feel, and I love that word, Hank, transported. Um, that's 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 what I'm absolutely hoping a reader experiences. And so to enter the world um, bit by bit by bit, you need to, I really think storytelling is a lot about taking the reader by the hand and building that trust, saying, um, come with me. I know there are lots of things vying for your attention. There are a million TV shows. There's other books. There's there's all kinds of things that um, are pulling at you. Come, come, you know, take my hand. I won't let you go. And I'm going to lead you down a path. And we're going to see some really cool things along the way. How much, how much can I give a reader in terms of of truth, of surprise, of entertainment, of of entering that world, and the world is complete, and it's got a kind, it's got a shimmer to it, and a shimmer in the way of um, those little details you're talking about. Yeah. So, um, for me, I had been reading on the quake for years. It it captured my imagination. This idea that in the space of a minute, an entire society can collapse. And um, how, how the suddenness of that and what you do with that was fascinating to me. I had those books on a shelf and and they kind of worked their magic on me. I didn't know when, when or even if I would use that material. But when I started conjuring Vera and, and, and Rose, um, it seemed it, it, they it all came together. Oh, of course, that's where I'll set the book. Um, of course, that gives me that gives me this moment that um, across the years of writing the book seemed like there were echoes in our society today of of what 
of what is underneath the underbelly of society. Um, all those tensions, all those conflicts coming to the foreground. Of course, I could never have anticipated, you know, these last few years, uh, certainly couldn't have anticipated the pandemic. I finished the book in January of 2020. So I really didn't know what was coming, but it seems that this, that we are living in a moment of, um, of catastrophe and who and what rises from it and how we rejigger our lives and reevaluate our lives um, seems, seems um, it's, uh, those are some of the things that, that Vera and, and the cast of characters are looking at. Uh, Carol, you, you mentioned the, um, kind of the the state of the world and the state of entertainment right now where where we do find ourselves uh with so many options of things to occupy our time and to occupy our imaginations and storytelling if you if you want to look at it that way is uh is alive and well but though sometimes the medium that is used uh is morphing and changing and and netflix and youtube and all of these sorts of things are, are now vying for our attention. And, and I know this is a, a topic that you're very passionate about and that you speak about uh, quite often. Um, but why why do stories matter? And and specifically, um, why does this uh, this art form of uh, of novels and, and writing novels and reading novels? Why is that still so important today? You know, let's go back to the beginning when we used to, at the end of the day, um, gather around the fire and tell the story of the day. What storytelling connects us to, it connects us to one another and it connects us to our hearts. Um, you know, we can all, we're all being just barraged with the news constantly. But what the news doesn't give us is how one thing relates to the next thing. It doesn't tell us the essential connection of, and then this happened, and then, and then, and then, and what it means to me, and what it means to you, and what it means to both of us. How, how, how are we, how are we going to come together? And that's what storytelling does. Um, it is such, uh, it's essential part of how we make sense of our daily lives and how we make sense of the lives before and and to come. You know, I think I think for novels to really work, they have to have that immediacy. They have to feel like the news of the day. I've got to tell you this. You know, that kind of grabbing someone by the lapels and saying, "I've got this story. I got to tell you." I think it's I think I I hope my novels have that kind of urgency and also that that, you know, different folks, different personalities, different, you know, the places we come from may be different. It, you know, there's so much talk these days about division. Stories bring us together and they remind us about what is true in all of us. You know, I often think. I mean, you know, so much has happened in terms of technology, in terms of our lifestyles, everything since 1906. But, you know, the one thing that hasn't been retooled is the human animal. Right. We're, we're, we're the same. We're full of ambition and joy and and contradiction and folly. And as much of that, as much of that complexity that makes us so in, incredible and confounding that I can get on the page, um, that's what I try to do. Well, and when you have a story of uh, a teenage girl over 100 years ago and you read it and it feels so immediate that this could be ripped from today's headlines in, in a lot of ways and, and you feel an, an empathy with that character, um, that's that's when you know that this is a thing that we have to protect and, and that has to continue. Yeah, we need to tell our stories. Our stories, our our stories are are essential. You know, I really think 
um, if, you know, and I, I think kids are so good at this when they're such great, they're natural storytellers. And, um, you know, they cut out the stuff that's superficial and they basically just get, they get to the essential heart of a story really quickly. And if you think about, um, in some way, we're all storytellers. We all sit at, at the table, those of us who, who still sit at a table for dinner or even just, you know, on the phone or whatever it is, that, that conversation that goes between us is how we make sense of our daily lives. And, and a, novel, a novel can do that in, in, a, in a much more um, complex way and entertaining way. Absolutely. Well, Vera, uh, a novel is available everywhere now when you're hearing this, uh, no matter if you uh, are love to, to read books on your Kindle or hold the paper in your hand or listen to audiobooks. It's available everywhere now. We're going to put links to it in the show notes of this episode to make it easier for you to find. Uh, Carol, if people are just learning about you and want to dig into all the great stuff that you do, is there a place where they can find you online and connect with you? Absolutely. Um, just go to my name, caroledgarian.com. And it's all there. Uh, up, I, mean, I have a, you know, in our virtual world, I'm I'm going to be at bookstores all around the country, um, and you don't ever have to leave your living room. Don't have to take off your furry slippers. Um, we're um, <laughs> just register for for one of my events, um, and um, they'll send you the virtual link. I'll be touring um, all through March and April, and would love to have you join me. Excellent. We'll put links to that in the show notes as Great. well. Fantastic. Carol, this has been so much fun. Uh, I'm recommending Vera to everyone. Oh, and uh, thank you so much for taking time to come on the show today. Thank you so much, Hank. And, and be well. I love what you do. Authors, if you're looking for a partner to help ensure that your book is the best it can possibly be, look no farther than Pico's House. Crystal and her staff make a conscious effort to be critical, yet courteous. They also strive to make the business side of things run smoothly so that you can rest easy knowing that your manuscript is in capable hands. Whether you need beta reading, developmental editing, a manuscript critique, line editing, copy editing, or proofreading, Pico's House is the one-stop shop for you. Check them out today at picoshouse.com to get started. Dream Author by Sophie Hanna is an immersive 14-month coaching program for writers at any and every level of experience, and also for those of you who want to write and are just waiting for the right encouragement and guidance to get you started. Your writing dreams should make you happy. For so many of us, our dreams are not a source of happiness. Instead, they cause us stress, guilt, frustration, and even shame. Here's the great news. All of these feelings are natural and all writers experience them. The problem, though, is that when your writing dreams bring you more anxiety than joy, it affects your resolve and your productivity, and you end up not taking the action you need to take in order to propel your dreams in the right direction so that they can stand a strong chance of coming true. That's why Sophie created the Dream Author Coaching Program to teach anyone who is passionate about writing how to change the way they build, think about, and pursue their writing dreams in order to become their own most powerful ally and advocate for the rest of their writing life. And more great news, once you've learned that skill, it lasts forever. Visit dreamauthorcoaching.com to get started today. The Bad Company Complete Series Omnibus, books one through seven. Humanity's greatest export, justice. Space is a dangerous place, even for the wary, especially for the unprepared. The aliens have no idea. Here comes the Bad Company. The Bad Company Book 1, Colonel Terry Henry Walton, takes his warriors into battle for a price in this first installment of The Bad Company. He believes in the moral high ground and is happy to get paid for his role in securing it. Set in the Cutharian Gambit universe, Terry, Char, and their people humans, werewolves, were tigers, and vampires form the core of the Bad Company's direct action branch, a private conflict solution enterprise. 
Join them as they fight their way across Tissakinan 4, where none of the warring parties were what they expected. The seven-book series Omnibus includes The Bad Company, Blockade, Price of Freedom, Liberation, Destroyer, Discovery, Overwhelming Force. Grab the complete Bad Company series by Craig Martell now. How to Be a Badass Witch by Michael Anderley. Virtutus Gloria Mercies. Translation, glory is the reward of valor. Fed up with playing the normal game, recent university graduate, ex cum laude, ex soccer star, ex popular and mostly broke Cara Madonna changes her life when she decides to research how to be a witch and believes it. Cara didn't want to go back east and deal with her overbearing mom, so when university was done, she stayed behind in Los Angeles. Little did she realize how controlling moms can be from the other side of the country. Feeling a little desperate to make her own way, she buys a few books on business and one on a lark, How to Be a Badass Witch. That's when the trouble started. Find out just what trouble a young woman can get into when the magic just might be real. How to Be a Badass Witch by Michael Andrews.